right? What we celebrate when he was born into this world in human flesh. He's been here since the beginning. The backdrop of events leading up to the crucifixion had been carefully woven throughout scripture. Predictions, shadows, and descriptions of a savior began in Genesis chapter 3 with God's statement to the serpent that he would cause hostility and that Satan would strike the Savior's heel while the Savior would simultaneously strike Satan in the head. We can see Christ in the book of Exodus as the Passover lamb. We see him in the poetry of King David as the Lord who will be king and priest in Psalms 110. The prophet Isaiah predicted a servant who would carry the sins of all of us, refuse to defend himself, and then be unjustly condemned to die as a criminal. But many in Israel did not understand the clues. Instead, as our human nature tends to do, they created an image in their minds of what they wanted their Messiah to be. The appearance of a deliverer would not have been unexpected, but for the careful observer, the evidence of a plot twist was scattered all along the way. Instead of coming as a warrior who would overthrow an earthly kingdom, Jesus came as a humble servant. He chose to bring spiritual deliverance through the ultimate act of sacrificial love. This twist of events changed not only history, but the destiny of humanity forever. That's pretty heavy. That's pretty solid right there. So let's break this down a bit. Jesus was our lamb, a sacrifice. Under the Old Testament law, the blood of animals had to be shed over and over again to atone for people's sin. This act, for every sin, constantly reminded them of their guilt. But it pointed forward to the death of Jesus, whose blood could, in a single act, take away sin permanently. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls, goats, to take away sins. That is why when Jesus came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. Then I said, Lord, I have come to do your will, O God. As is written about me in the scriptures, he cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all time. Three other times, people challenged Jesus to prove who he was by saving himself. What the crowds, the soldiers, and the criminals did not understand was that he didn't come to elevate himself, but to save the world. Jesus came to display his power, not through acts of self-preservation, but through acts of selfless love. What some people might view as weakness was actually great sacrifice. We can see in Luke that the crowds watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah and the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. It was not unusual for the criminal to carry his execution charge for which he was being condemned. The Roman government could not have known the weight of truth carried in these words. In Jeremiah 23, it says, For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom, for he will do what is just and right throughout the land. It has been prophesied that God would raise up a king for Israel from the line of King David. In an earthly kingdom, the death of a king often meant the end of the kingdom. But for God's eternal kingdom, death was a key, a part of this never-ending kingdom. We see in Luke 23... Moving on to the next part, that by this time it was about noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. 
Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Now, the, the curtain of the temple being torn down the middle is symbolic in a big way. The original curtain separated the more common areas of the temple from the most holy place, reserved only for the high priest. But because of Jesus' sacrificial work, every believer is empowered to have access to that presence of God now. It's important to note that it was torn from the top down, not the bottom up. Not as if someone came underneath it and ripped it, but as if God tore it down himself. Though Luke doesn't clearly explain the meaning of the torn veil, we do see it here in Hebrews. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. God himself did away with the old system. With Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, a new way has been opened up for us. Once and for all, Jesus became our great high priest. Also in Hebrews, it says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings that we do, and yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I don't know about you, but that brings a lot of comfort. It's very comforting, and we can rest in those words. But now we're going to go deeper. This is the part that God has given me for you guys this week. How often do we rely on others to go to God on our behalf rather than accessing him directly? The veil was torn, but sometimes we forget that in our daily life? I'm going to phrase this a little differently and say, do you know Jesus or do you just know about him? It's really interesting when you you think about that. One way with people to know how well you really know someone is think about how you respond when they're walking down the grocery store aisle to you. (laughs) When it's an acquaintance, right? Just, you know them, right? You know about them. Maybe you've worked with them before. But if if you're really in a hurry, you're probably, you may just kind of try to go down the next aisle that you don't really need to go down, but you really just don't want to do the small talk today about the weather and the stuff, right? But when it's someone you know, like you really know, you might actually avoid the aisle you're supposed to go down and go down their aisle because you want to connect with them and because you know that they're a safe place, they're a safe person, they're someone that, hey, it's wild today, but they're going to understand because they know me and I know them. The first time this really struck me was a couple years ago. I don't even know why this makes me so emotional, but it always does. I was just walking down the street. You got to understand, I grew up in the country, so um, I tend to avoid people when I go for walks. I kind of treat the streets like the grocery store aisles. <laughs> Usually if there's someone, if I see someone coming, I'll, I'm like, okay, how am I going to get around and not have this awkward pass? Um, It really helps when my husband's with me because he'll say hi to everyone every time. We can be climbing a mountain and have no air left in our lungs. And I'm like, babe, this is a good excuse. You don't have to say hi to every person. And he still does. I don't know how he does it. That's why we fit together and and I need you because he says hi and I get to just go right on by. So (laughs) a huge introvert here, okay, if you're an introvert, I feel you. So that's, I was walking down the street, and there was someone coming in my direct line, and I'm like, okay. But as I got closer, the realization hit me that I knew them. It was one of my youth students. I hadn't really seen them in a while, but I knew them. 
And my whole demeanor changed. It went from like, oh, okay, here's a person, to, oh, I know them. And my face lit up, my whole body just relaxed, and it was filled with joy because I know this person. And we stopped and talked. When you really know someone, I don't know, I think maybe in Alliance we kind of forget this, it's a small town. So we're used to knowing about a lot of people, right? Again, in the store, wherever you go, you kind of know who the Alliance people are. You might even know where they live. You might know their name, you might know their kids, you might know where they work. But really knowing someone is different. There's something intangible. There's something about it that's just different. You know their personal likes and dislikes, their hopes, their dreams, their personality, how they talk, but not in a resume paper kind of way. Like, you just, you know them. And it's possible to know Jesus the same way. In John 10, 14, it says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. This is really important. <laughs> Because Jesus also said that when we die and we go to heaven, he'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. He had just listed, you know, people will come to me and say, I did these things in your name. I did all these good works. I even cast out demons in your name, Jesus. We can know a lot about him. We can even do really good things with his name attached. But knowing him, is something different. So I'm going to have my uh, youth help me with a little illustration. I need TJ to come up first. The rest of you can kind of come over here in the corner as well. So last week, when I was sitting here in this sanctuary, I'm not going to lie, I felt very overwhelmed. I was trying to keep a lot of things going at once. And for some reason, this image is what was in my head. And I was actually going to do this at youth group for a thing, but I think we need it today <laughs> here. So TJ, go ahead and come up. All right, so, you know, a lot of times we're keeping some stuff in the air, right? It's life. We got things we got to be responsible for, bills and our jobs and kids, family stuff. Okay, guys, you can start. But that can quickly get overwhelming. We start to have a lot more stuff to do, not just our own, but we got other people's responsibilities. More bills. <laughs> And pretty soon we feel like that. I don't know about you, but I have felt like that this week. And not just this week, but many times in my life. All right, guys, you can start helping. But when I realize I'm not alone, it makes it a whole lot easier. Thank you, guys. All right, you can let them drop as some nice decorations for the rest of the sermon. <laughs> I know. I mean, you could all bat them around like it was graduation services where you have the beach ball. So for me, I have felt like that a lot recently. <clears throat> I feel a lot like Martha a lot. Um, those of you may know this story and those may not, so we're going to summarize it a little bit. Jesus went to visit the house of Martha and Mary, and Martha was scrambling to prepare dinner and get every last detail right. And Mary was just in there sitting with Jesus, not a care in the world, just sitting in his presence. Well, understandably, to me it's understandable, Martha complained to Jesus, why isn't she helping me? Tell her to help me. I wrestle with this one, okay? This story is one of all the epic Bible stories. This is the one I want to go back in time. And I don't know if I just want to be a fly on the wall and watch, like, oh, okay, did she just leave the dinner and no one ate that night? 
Did she sit the feet of Jesus? Did she go outside and cry? I don't know what happened. I at least want to go and just help her fix the dinner, for goodness sake. Someone help the woman. (laughs) And I really want to see how it plays out because Jesus kind of just leaves it. He says, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. But there's only one thing to be concerned about, and Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. And it ends. Cliffhanger. Really? <laughs> How do we do that? What did she discover? I, this, this just always sticks with me. How do I get the work done, Lord? Because someone's got to do it. But still fit it, sit at the feet of Jesus at the same time. Just wait. God answered this for me while I was writing this, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so follow along with me here. In the next few months, our church family is going to be going through a big transition, change. I'm so glad you're here today, Brooke and Jim. Uh, But we're really going to miss you. We're going to miss you a lot. They're going to be retiring and hopefully enjoying time with family and having fun on their new house project. I say fun. Maybe it doesn't feel so fun after (laughs) you've been working on it this week. But time, you know, we get in routines, and we get used to things. We get used to patterns, and routine saves us time and energy. So whenever any little thing, even if you change the way you brush your teeth in the morning, it takes extra time and extra energy, and it creates stress. So you can imagine the stress it creates when people that have been a part of our lives and that we rely on aren't there. <clears throat> we rely on them for many things. Some of them we know, and some we're going to find out <laughs> real quick. And my initial response is to be fearful and overwhelmed. But Jesus assures us that we're not alone and that there's only one thing to be truly concerned about, our Savior, It's going to be really hard in the next few months to not get distracted by all the balloons that need to be kept in the air. There's going to be a lot. There's going to be new ones. There's going to be different ones. First, we need to realize that not all these balloons even need to be kept afloat, like fear and unforgiveness and resentment, bitterness, doubts, and pride. Second, As you saw, we need to be quick to share these burdens together as a family. And I want to say I've been so encouraged these past few weeks. I've seen so many of you stepping up, listening, turning your ear to God's direction. You've been praying diligently for each other. You've just been lending a hand wherever. I've seen it. God's already moving. He's already moving in your hearts, and I know that. So take hope in that. All right, the last little story I want to talk about is when Jesus and his disciples were on the boat at sea, and there was a massive storm going on. A wave came that almost capsized the boat. That's scary. (laughs) Understandably, they were frightened, and understandably, they went to wake Jesus up, who was sleeping in the bottom of the boat. Totally reasonable response, I feel like, right? Right? What they asked him is, don't you care if we drown? He got up, and he did indeed stop the waves, and he calmed it. But he said, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Well, usually I've looked at that and just thought, shh, they didn't think Jesus could fix this. Like, come on. It's easy to look down on them. But we miss the key in there. They didn't ask him if he could stop the waves. They asked if he cared enough to stop the waves. Jesus chided them for not having faith that he cared for them in the situation they were in. Time and time again, the Lord has answered my prayers and showed me he cares for me, for his church family, for this whole world. He sent his son to die for us. And yet, I still find myself taking on unnecessary burdens every, before every weekly youth service, every outreach, bake sale, every time someone I love is struggling. 
it's so easy to forget. It was mentioned last week that there is an importance to repenting for doubting that God can still move, that he still cares. The people are not too far gone for the gospel to transform their lives. Maybe that's you today. I, I know I've been there. Or maybe you feel like you are too far gone for your sins to be forgiven. If our eyes are fixed on Jesus our pr- and our prayers are aligned with his will, which is for all mankind to be made holy and receive eternal life in heaven, then we can rest in the assurance that God cares about these things way more than we ever could. So I'm, I'm typing this on my laptop, right, on Friday, and this is where it hits me. And my friends, I think this is why Jesus didn't finish the story about Martha. He was showing her the truth about where her focus should be. And it's not that he didn't care about dinner <laughs> being made or how hard she was working. He's fed 5,000 people from a couple loaves. He turned the water to wine. He could have easily snapped his fingers and the food could have been made, right? But it's not that he didn't care about that. It's that he cared about her more. He cared about her eternity more than the food and the chores. Just like he cares more about you. More than what's on your to-do list today. First Peter 5 says, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Do you believe that God cares about you? Or that thing you've been stressing about? Do you believe he cares about where you spend your eternity? All of human history culminated at that fateful moment on the cross. Christ our Savior came to be a sacrifice for our sins. And he's now in heaven with God the Father. For those of us who accept Jesus' sacrifice, he will be our Savior, eternal priest and king. So we have a couple questions for us to just munch on. And we are going to, of course, as always, open up the altar. If you need to come forward for prayer, we're here. Or talk to the person you came with today. But what does Jesus' death mean for you? Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? Not just a whole bunch of facts about him. Do you know him? Does your to-do list feel bigger than God's love? Are you juggling things you were never meant to juggle? Like fear, unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, doubts, pride. Ask the Lord to search your heart in these things today. God loves us. He cares about the thing more than you even do. So going forward, just know we're, we have each other. And we have God's love. We're not alone. I think Cisco said he mentioned last week that just because our beloved pastors are not going to be here physically with us, they're still going to be here. We can still talk to them and communicate and um, ask for prayers and pray for them, but God is still here. He's still going to be here, and he's the one we need to keep our eyes on, and he will guide us. He'll lead us through whatever might come. All right. We'll pr- close in prayer. So before we dismiss, guys, um, you can stay up here, babe. Um, my wife and I, we were talking at Sam and Louis yesterday, and we were just discussing the wha- where God's taken us as a church. Um, we just want you to know that we, we feel your guys' love. We feel your prayers. Um, we have a strong, strong church. We really do. It's no longer about leaders. It's about the groups that we have in our church. 
all the women's group, all the men's group, the worship team. There's power, there's unity in our church. And God's going to use it. So you feel like you're maybe backsliding, or you don't feel like you're part of our church, you are. Just do me a favor and just close your eyes. God, we just want to thank you. Because, Lord, you, you use mess-ups, God. You use people that have gone astray and have been hurt, God, and been molded by your hands, God. Thank you for your redemption, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your loving forgiveness, Lord. Father, we place our church people in your hands, God. We, we place everything that we are before your throne. The people that are watching online too, God, I pray for them, Lord. Though they may be out of town or they may be in town, God, watching our service, God. They're part of our, our service. They're part of our, our, our church. And I pray for them, God, as well, that you awaken them, God, to be part physically to come to church and be part of something great, greater than us. Holy Spirit, we always welcome you and we love you. And we just want to treasure what you're doing in our church, God. Help us not miss it. Because you really do care about us, God. You really do care about us. In Jesus' mighty name. And we all say, amen. We're going to have an opportunity for anybody who wants to get prayed for. Um, but other than that, you are dismissed. We love you. And may God bless you.